And so welcome everyone to the raw and uncut version. I was, I have to admit, very, very starstruck. This person that we had on today, I would rather have on than just about anybody that I know, except for maybe Dolly Parton. But <laughs> we're we're going to get Dolly one day. She's just such a peach. But today we have BDR from Lead IQ, Jeremy Levier. Did I say his name right? Levier. Jeremy oh. Levier. C'est français. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. But listen up, y'all. If you want some hints, tips, and actual things to try using video. If you want to find out how he got to the top of his game at like what three different companies really quickly, listen up and just listen to his passion and even insights. He gives you some clues, especially if you sell into technology. He gives you some actual places to go to look for information. Um, yeah, yeah. Rockstar, practical, applicable, watch the whole thing. It's a really great one. So here we go. Peace out. Welcome, welcome everyone to the sellout show where we are always sold out. I am Diana Guerin and I am the irreverent sales girl where my mission is to bring a dash of dignity to the art of selling. Hey everyone, I'm Sean Carroll Sandy. I'm the chief revenue officer of the selling agency where we coach humans how to sell to humans. Because if you're selling like an authority or an expert and you haven't actually picked up the phone in 10 or 15 years, you ain't got Bleep. <laughs> That's right. I just I just threw it down. <laughs> That's right. Mic drop. Well, and it's such a perfect introduction because who we have today is Jeremy. Do you say it Laville? Levier. Oh, yeah. Levier. It's so much it's so That's much nicer, better. yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's French. <laughs> That's how you get people to call you back. You've got a great last name. Um, yep. Yeah, so I'm really excited to have Jeremy on the call today, on, the, on our video today, because he's somebody who's perfect for the sellout show, where we talk about boots on the ground, phone in the hand, tangible activities of practitioners that are out there doing it every day. And Jeremy, you've become worldwide famous in our, in our little world <laughs> for being this badass BDR. And um, so anyway, there's one story that I can't wait to share about uh, the post that you made that made me really mm -hmm. sit up and take notice. So did Trish. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so welcome. This is uh, just such a pleasure to have you. Is there anything that you'd like to say about yourself to get started? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm Jeremy Levier and like Diana said, I'm a, I'm a badass BDR. Um, BD, I'm the SDR team lead here at Lead IQ. Um, we're, we're a startup. Um, we're a sales tool that, that helps sales reps and, and sales leaders and sales operations people be more productive. Um, and yeah, I've been here for like nine, 10 months now. Um, I've actually been a BDR at three different companies. Um, and each one moved up from BDR to team lead twice. And then the other time from BDR to channel manager, um, at Navisite, which is part of, um, charter communications and spectrum enterprise. I was a channel sales manager there. So I've been in sales for a few years and, um, earlier this year, won SDR of the year, um, at the 10 bound sales development conference and booked 69 meetings in only my second month here. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit about me. High five. <laughs> Yeah, and I and I like to wear. I have a collection of NBA throwback jerseys as well. This is a Reggie Miller here, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> wow. Right. Well, so I want to I want to jump into. There's so many things that we want to ask you. Something that just immediately um, caught my attention, and I think that for the the folks that Diana and I um, talk to and train, coach, speak to, one question I have. You said you moved up at several of the companies that you've been in, how did you, how did you do that? It's like give, give people an idea of, okay, well, this is what it takes up to, takes to move up from SDR to team lead. What is it in you that got you to those places? Tell us, tell us, tell us. <laughs> yeah, I think number one is you just have to do more. So what I mean by that is, you know, don't just like, A, don't just look at the SDR as just like a stepping stone role. You know, mm. so, so many people see mm. it as just like, you know, there's this perception in the industry that, you know, SDR, BDR, ADR, whatever you call it, is just like this low level entry level role um, that you just do and you just go through the motions until you can get to be an AE, which some people, th you know, think of as 
the real job as a as an account executive and mm -hmm. um you know i think you part of it is just not seeing it as just like a stepping stone role like actually embracing it and making the most of it treating it as a profession and 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 like making the most of it and not just going through the motions of just like making a bunch of calls and emails and you know not really giving a hoot um and really Stay, coming in early, staying late. I mean, I, so many, so many times when I was at Navisite, I would work until. I, I sometimes I would work until eight thirty at night, be be in the office, or I would work until six, but then I'd go home and I'd be watching a podcast like CXO Talk, CXOTalk.com, which is the single biggest reason why I was hitting my quota when I was there because I was selling to CIOs and IT directors. I, I didn't know what an IT director's job was like and what their priorities like and what you know how to sell to them, what their day is like. Because, Brilliant. you know, these guys are IT directors and CIOs. Like, I, I didn't go to school for IT. These guys have been in IT for 20 years. But I'm watching a podcast where the world's best IT directors and CIOs are interviewed. And you get to be in their head and in their mind and in their world and speak their language by watching this podcast. I, you know, a lot of times I would maybe get home at 7 and then from, you know, while I'm cooking dinner or instead of watching Netflix, I'm watching CXO talk. So just doing more and really getting – the business acumen and buyer knowledge that you need knowledge, everything that you can learn about your buyer. Um, yeah. And, and then also just kind of doing more like coming in early, staying late, not just working nine to five, like putting in more hours, like nights and weekends, like, and people are like, Oh, well, aren't you going to get burnt out? Or what do you ha You have no social life or something like, yeah, I, I still do have a social life and you know, hang out with friends sometimes and hang out with my girlfriend. But like at the same time, it doesn't even seem like work to me. Like, I'll, I don't even like think twice when, you know, when I'm here in the office until like seven thirty or eight o'clock, like it doesn't even seem like work. I'm, you know, I'm prospecting, I'm like making videos for prospects and stuff like that. And like, it doesn't even feel, it, it feels it's fun for, for me. So yeah, that's some of it. That's great insights. Oh, CXO.com, CXOTalk.com. You are so speaking Sean's language. She, mm -hmm. she just is all about getting in the head of your buyer and mm -hmm. learning what their day looks like. Um, I think that is absolutely brilliant. So how did you discover that? How did you discover CXO Talk as, as something that mm -hmm. was going to be a resource for you? Because there are, I, I would just like to lay out sort of, if you're going to get in your buyer's head, what are, how did you discover that resource? Yeah, good question. So um, the short answer is Jill Rowley, um, and how that came to be was I made a blog post on LinkedIn like a couple of years ago when you know everybody was posting blog posts on LinkedIn and stuff, and I was trying to build my brand. And um, the blog post was actually called um, "Hey Sales Reps, Your Prospects Don't Owe You," and then the S word. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how this podcast, yeah, how censored we we can be or whatever. Um, <laughs> You did a bleep before, so it's just like S H and then an exclamation point and then T is what the title of the blog post is. And it's, you know, talking about how, you know, sales reps, you know, the prospect doesn't owe you anything. It's on you to provide enough value to get a response. So, like, don't get all mad if, like, they're not wanting to book a meeting or they don't reply to your email or call or whatever. And then Jill Rowley commented on the post and said, hey, Jeremy, great blog post. Looks like you sell to IT based on your LinkedIn profile. Here's a podcast I think that would be really valuable to you to get to know your buyer better and be more buyer centric and get in their heads and stuff. And then she posted the link to the podcast in the comment. Um, and then I, that's <clears throat> how I started watching it. And I, you know, that like 80 episodes later is when I started crushing quota. That's oh awesome. God. Jill is a phenomenal, phenomenal social selling master. Yeah. Insights mm -hmm. about crafting your sales practice around social phenomenal i love mm -hmm. you yeah and she wasn't even like you know trying like social yeah. selling because i wasn't like a buyer for her but she you know obviously just likes to add value for people and knows that it'll just kind of come back around in some way so yeah. yeah it helped me out a lot and then you know when i became a channel manager at navisite i started mm -hmm. i came across just through linkedin and just networking with people that are channel managers or um people that are in charge of master agencies who were the partners that i would work with um just through like networking and connecting with some of these people on LinkedIn, I came across um, this other podcast called Channel Outlaws. So now that was that was my go-to podcast. Now I was a channel manager. I was now you know um, every day watching every single minute of every episode of Channel Outlaws that I could because that allowed me to know inside and out everything that I possibly could about the people I was partnering with and the yep. people that I was now going to be selling to. 
That's there is a podcast for everything. Thank God. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was, uh, well, first of all, you just have such ingenious ideas and they're so actionable. But the one that really, really caught my eye and Trish commented on it, Trish Bertuzzi commented on it too, was this idea of how do you figure out who's the next account to go after? So can you share, if, if people didn't have the opportunity to read that post, um, if we're really, really good, we'll put it in the show notes, but can you, uh, can you share what your idea was? Yeah, of course. So basically um, what I say in the post is if you're ever stuck and you know, you're an AE or SDR or whatever, you don't know what account to go after next, look in your CRM, look at the last uh, deal that your company closed, who, who signed with you last, mm -hmm. and then just in less than 10 seconds, you can use like LinkedIn or Google or Owler or something, find their top competitor, bam, sell to them. And then next step is, well, who do you reach out to at that company? Well, look in your CRM again at that deal that you just closed, who was the person that took that initial first meeting um, with you at that, at that account? What was their title? Then use LinkedIn to find the person with that title at that company. Um, and then of course, shameless plug, use lead IQ to, you know, get that person's contact info into your CRM with one click. Um, <laughs> and, oh, what? You know, so, so basically that's, that's, you know, that's, that's the tip. Yeah. That's the, um, you know, and, and I think that does a couple things. Like one is, you know, um, fear of missing out and competition. And like, if you're, if you're reaching out to somebody, you know, if I'm reaching out to, um, Vidyard and I, ha and we have Videolicious as a, as a, you know, customer, you know, like the, the person from Vidyard is like, Oh geez, you know, these guys are using lead IQ. Like maybe, maybe we should too. And you know, I want, that's who what we compete with. Like what are they doing that we're not doing? So mm -hmm. that's going to make them cause that's going to cause them to, to respond and, you know, to, to act and to take a meeting or more likely to, you know, be, have a positive reply and more likely to take a meeting and more likely to buy from you. But then there's also just simply relevance. You know, when you're reaching out to somebody, um, that you, your message has to be relevant to them, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so mm -hmm. it lets them know, lets that buyer know when you're calling or emailing them that your product is relevant to them because their top competitor just bought it, you know, so because of the fear of missing out, competition and the relevance together is going to make that person much more likely to, you know, um, reply or, you know, take a meeting, buy from you. And that's huge because obviously in this day and age, uh, there's just so much noise out there. There's so much competition out there. Like it's so easy for uh, a prospect to just, you know, delete or ignore that email yeah. you sent them or just not pick up the phone or not re return your calls. It's so hard for, you know, AEs and SDRs to get replies um, from prospects, but that's one way you can do to cut through the noise and, and actually get some, some replies and get some meetings. Yeah. It, it, and we, I call it when we're training, you, you mentioned both social proof and context proof. So social proof is, Hey, look at these other companies we've worked for. They're real. <laughs> They're like, well, and so people go, Hmm, I'm like them. And then context proof is you've proven that you know how to solve a problem that they have. So mm -hmm. the, you know, your, your biggest hurdle as sorry, someone who's prospecting is to, is to, to build credibility such that people understand the first and foremost thing is that you're not going to waste their time. And mm -hmm. so yep. social proof, context proof, so key to do that. It's clear yeah. up front. You're not, it's not gimmicky. It's not tactics. It's really, mm -hmm. you know, it's up front. Like, Hey, I recognize that company. They work with them. They're like me. Oh, you, you've solved that problem. We have that problem. It's immediately connecting people with how you're valuable. Great job. Yeah. That's awesome. And the, and the other piece to that too, is just um, simply efficiency uh, of, a, of a sales rep. You know, I think from, from where, where I'm sitting and I, what I've been seeing is a lot of, you know, whether if they're an individual rep, they're, they're an A account executive or an SDR or whatever they, they are, it seems to me like a lot of reps are getting stuck, spinning their wheels, spending too much time building lists and sourcing leads and right. trying to figure out, figure out the right account or, you know, then trying to figure out who the right person at that account is. So that's just a way to kind of speed it up and make it faster and more efficient for that rep to not be, you know, 20, 20 minutes later, and they still don't even, you know, this 20 minutes just looking for an account and, and then another 20 minutes trying to find the person at that, you know, and, and so anything you can do to kind of speed that up and make yeah. a rep more efficient too. Mm -hmm. Well, and your buyer, I mean, please, one of the problems with all of the 
technology and the practices and the processes that a lot of sales development rep, sales organizations are using to reach out to executives is just jamming up their inbox and it just mm-hmm. makes them angrier and yeah. they have something really truly relevant it's got to kind of like shine through mm-hmm. right? yep mm-hmm. a- absolutely yeah there's there's so much stuff out there like every day we all get these emails that are not relevant at all to right. us and you know i just had somebody email me yesterday that was saying hey do you want a list of you know you want information for software you know engineers and software developers and devops and i'm like that isn't even anywhere close to what i do like yeah. i couldn't i hit the delete i couldn't hit the delete button any faster you know it's just like you know <laughs> but it just so wasted your time i mean we're having a conversation about it now <laughs> do you know it's like it's such a waste of time and you know your your um your ability to just get into somebody's inbox is going to continue to diminish if you continue to practice this way. I mean, Mm -hmm. the people are going to figure out better and better ways to keep you out. And so I just think it makes so much sense and it's so kind for you to be that much smarter about your outreach. So yay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. definitely. Like I just looked at my spam folder the other day and, um, you know, there was like messages that weren't actually spam that were just going into spam anyways. And like, it says the reason why I was marked as spam was because other people from that domain or that same email address or other people mm-hmm. from, that comp- from that domain or messages similar to that right. message were, had been marked as spam by other people. So it's like, you know, the spam, fo- spam filters by these companies these days are just so strict of, you mm-hmm. know, like trying to keep things out um, that, you know, you have to do what you can to be- make it more relevant and have more context. Otherwise, your messages are going to get marked as spam, and then nobody's going to see them. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, Jeremy, help a sister out, and if you would <laughs> give us an example of a great subject line that would get through the clutter, or something you would use. Just, an, just an example. Something really people can use. A few that I use. Um, if I notice that the person has been with the company for a long time, which is pretty rare these days because, you know, people change jobs so frequently, like, you know, like mm-hmm. the average VP of sales only stays at a company for like 18 months. Right. Um, if I notice they've been at the company for like six or more years, I'll, you know, the subject line will say, congrats on eight years at XYZ company, comma, Sean you know, um, actually putting their name and Mm -hmm. the name of their company and how long they've been at the company um, in there. If I notice they haven't been at the company for that long, um, you know, and they, their previous company was IBM and now they're at Oracle. My subject line simply will say from IBM to Oracle. They, it's going to, it's, it's just going to pique their interest. They're going to be like, Hmm, you know, there there could only possibly be sent to that one person. I mean, unless there was like a bunch of people that went for IBM, <laughs> but usually, you know, it's not going to be these you know huge companies. It, and it's going to be they're going to be like, okay, this got to only be just for me. Um, last, lastly, um, another one that I use a lot is made you a rock video, comma Sean, or you know, <laughs> made made you a rap video, comma Diana. Um, you know, because it's like because I do that with some of the videos that I I send to prospects using Vidyard is like freestyle rap videos or I got a guitar right. in the back and I'll do a good, uh, I'll do a rock uh, guitar video or something. And so they, you know, they using that where it made you a video and you put their name in it. Like they're much more likely to, to open it up and, and respond. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got to jump in on this one because um, I haven't cracked the code yet on video prospecting and I want to hear what are your, what are the, what's the advice that you give? We even had Reed Oliver from Vineyard on. It's, it's a great show. I keep watching it over and over, but I've cracked the code after the first meeting Sending them a video has been so useful in speeding the sales cycle along, but getting that prospecting video right, I haven't done it yet. So what am I missing? What am I doing wrong? <laughs> um, yeah. So what are you doing right? <laughs> a, a few things that I try to do is, I don't know. I mean, I got a bunch of different things. Like wh- one is, <laughs> one is, you know, referencing that in the subject line, you know, made you a rock video, comma, Diana, that's the subject line. And then, I put Diana comma and then I skip a line and I put noticed that blah, 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 you know, whatever. Like we met, we met at, you know, sales 3.0 had a great conversation. So I made you this cool video or like whatever that, whatever like is causing me, whatever the trigger event is, whatever's causing me, you know, notice that you guys just implemented sales loft. So made you this cool video, whatever, notice that 
X. So it made you this cool video, like hyping it up. So you're kind of hype, hyping it up, um, you know, the, the video. And then you put that video there. Um, and then also, you know, uh, I think a lot of people I noticed that are putting the way they can do some of like the, these video technologies is they put the call to action like in the video or like a calendar link. And I think those, those are going to convert less because people don't want to click on a calendar link and then go right. and find a time and, you know, you're putting more work for them. So, you know, I'll, I'll do the video and I'll just be like, what are your thoughts or free to connect, you know, discuss this next week or, you know, or, or maybe I'll, I'll put like some suggested times um, and they can reply that way. But, the, you know, in the actual video, um, I think one mistake people do is they literally all they do is just turn the camera on and for one minute they just pitch their product and, and <laughs> no, they just not gonna and, do it. And, and, and they just basically instead of typing a really salesy email and they just instead will just take those same words that typically mm -hmm. they type and they just look turn the camera on and say those words with the camera on. Um, I think that's one mistake people do and instead like of I'll talking to that person like talking to that person like you're you know talking to the person on the other end right yeah yeah and and you know just like talk to them like a person and you know use your oh. person use use your personality a little bit and i mean you know i my best performing videos are ones where i do freestyle rap songs and and uh, guitar songs i'm not a rapper like i don't <laughs> I, don't, I don't like i don't i don't i don't play i don't have any I don't even know how to play the guitar. I don't even know how to hold it. But I think that's why I think that's why people get such a the prospects get such a kick out of it because I think if I actually knew how to play the guitar, then my reply rates would go down because it would look right. too polished. It would right. look too polished and you know, I I'm like I like I had one guy from Tech Target, a VP, that like replied back and he was like he dropped an F bomb and he's like this is effing awesome and like we had, <laughs> You know, like I, I, I sent this, I sent this to my entire team. He, like I got like a hundred different people opening it and stuff because I'm just like holding, holding the guitar wrong. And I'm like make, making up the words as I go along. I'm like singing, basically like talking about them as a company and mm -hmm. different tools that, that I know that they're using. And it's, it's a very relevant message to them. It's not salesy, but it's also talking about potential yeah. problems that they have. And I referenced a customer, one of their competitors, Madison Logic, who uses, uh, who uses right. us. And, you know, it was, you know, um, very not salesy and, and added a lot of value, but also, you know, here's this like crazy wacky guy, like doesn't even know how to hold the guitar. And he's just like... <laughs> And I'm strumming on the top part when you're not even supposed to do that. Like I, my girlfriend told me that I was, I was not even supposed to play the guitar that way. But anyways. So that, um, so that was really great information about videoing. And the one thing that I got out of that was not play a goofy guitar and freestyle rap. But <laughs> one thing that Sean and I talk about all the time is your personality yeah. is your competitive advantage in sales. Yeah. And you're using video to express your competitive advantage. So that's music to our ears. Yeah, mm -hmm. literally rap music to our ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like just find a way that your value prop and like the problem that your product solves, like find a way that you can be a little creative with, you know, showing the value that you have, but being creative with the video. So like, for example, like you could do this regardless of what you sell, but like one of the values that we have at LeeIQ is like every, there's different data providers that have direct dials and that used to be, you know, holy grail being able to get direct dials for all these people and bypass gatekeepers and right. and and direct directories and stuff we have, but people don't answer desk phones anymore or they don't even have them we have cell phone numbers for like anybody you could ever want to sell to so what i did was um you know if if i know for a fact that we have the correct cell phone number for a person because i like called them and i got their voicemail and you know said the person's name or whatever i know i know that we have the right cell phone number. I mean, we don't all, you know, it's not 100% accuracy, no data provider is. But once I've confirmed that, I'm going to then send them an email um, and I'm going to do it to the theme, the, the, to the tune of 8675309 Jenny. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm going to, ch I ch I've done, I've done this like 20, 25 times now and it's like probably a 90% reply rate. Um, I just booked a meeting do with this tactic with Zendesk. And um, so the subject line of the email says, the, per, the prospect's cell phone number and then their name instead of 8675309 Jenny, you know, their phone number and then Andy. Um, and then, you know, then when they click the video, I, you know, I, I have the lyrics to the song up and I'm, and I have my guitar and I'm playing the, I'm playing the, the song and I have the lyrics up on one screen 
And then their phone number using Lead IQ is also on that screen. And I just, I just changed out the lyrics to the song. And then instead of 8675309, put, I, I, I'm singing their actual cell phone, their cell phone number for the actual person that I'm sending the email, sending the video to. So, I mean, you know, regardless of what you sell, you can kind of come up with like, you know, something like that regardless of what you sell that kind of is creative and fun and it's entertaining, but also at the same time shows the value of your product. Well, and, and also I think another takeaway too in, in your prospecting um, success is that you have to show people really quickly that you've done your homework and that this is personalized and customized for them. Otherwise mm -hmm. they're going to just go pass. Right. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> I love, I love, yeah, I, you know, I love, I also love how you're talking about, um, you take what you're learning and then you turn it into content to share. That is such yeah. a gift. And I Thank think you. people, people are just, I'm going to keep what I know. And, and I, I, you know, we've all been in sales teams where it's like, no one's going to give up their trade secrets and no one's going to tell anybody what they're doing. Um, how, or how they, you know, how they're killing it and stuff. And it's such a gift to be able to do that. But I think that, you know, in abundance, it does come back to you. You're talking about Jill Rowley putting out, you know, giving you information for no other gain. Um, your social karma you know, directly impacts you and comes back to you in abundance. I'm your social sure. karma, is that new? Did we just coin that? Can we have that? <laughs> your social karma? Okay, so we don't have too much longer, but I did want to actually, um, I did want to ask you something that I think is going to be really useful to the sales development reps out there and the business development mm. reps. So, one thing that shines through about what you're sharing, Jeremy, is that you are in a position, at least at Lead IQ, where you're allowed to express your natural genius. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's true at every organization. So what I'd really love for you to share is, um, how did you, has it always been that way at the roles that you've been in? And you know, to give some advice to sales development reps who may be in a company that embraces the grind, um, how to kind of find the right right organization for yourself to be able to express that natural genius so that you can really shine and have your leadership show through. Yeah, I mean, I think one, one advantage, you know, um, that I have at Lead IQ is we have this culture where, you know, you're encouraged to be yourself, you know, have a personality, don't be a robot, build your brand. Um, I, I knew that going in, that was part of the reason why I took the job here because, you know, I've actually known Ryan O'Hara. We've known each other since high school um, really? for like we for like 15 years. We grew up like the next town over from each other. Um, and which is kind of cool. Like, you know, if people, you know, may have seen, may have seen some of his videos and blog posts and stuff. Um, and, and so I knew that going in that, you know, he's, he makes these silly videos, but they still, you know, add a lot of value at the same time. And that's part, you know, it's a small startup that's growing. And I think, you know, smaller tech startups kind of usually are able to be more creative with some of their marketing and some of their content and stuff. And, you know, where I came from, Navisite, 1,000 employee company um, that was part of an 80,000 employee company, Spectrum Enterprise. So um, actually some of the, I actually got a slap on the wrist a couple of times for some of the blog posts that I wrote referencing, comp, re referencing competitors. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, just like you can build your brand and like, you know, put some content out there. Just got to be careful that, you know, you don't say, you know, post anything that's going to get you in trouble, um, you know, with your employer. But um, another thing that, you know, another tip that I have with, with that is I did a video about this recently where it's like crawl, walk, run. If you don't know where to get started with building your brand, posting content, like social selling or anything like that, crawl, just start out by observing. So like, you know, the first year or two, first year, even two years that I was on LinkedIn and before I started posting any content, I was just observing, observing, observing content by people like Jill Rowley and Trish Bertuzzi and Ryan O'Hara and stuff mm -hmm. and wasn't posting anything. And then and walking was when I started to post, post content, but it wasn't my own original content. It was like maybe just, you know, company content that my marketing team put out or prospect content. I would see, you know, one of my prospects was featured on a podcast and I would post that on LinkedIn and, and tag that person in it um, or industry content. 
you know, like CXO talk episodes or, you know, if I'm selling to salespeople like sales hacker articles or Topo blog posts and stuff like that, you know, sharing stuff like that out there. And then run is when I start posting my own original content in addition to those other three types of content that I just mentioned. So by that time, by the time you get to the running, you're, that's when you're like four, six months into a role, you've had enough conversations with buyers and prospects that you can kind of formulate what might be valuable to your, your network and to your, your target buyer. Um, so you, you know what you know what, what might be valuable to that to them. You've been in the role enough time you know, at, at that point. Um, so that's some of the advice that I would give. And um, you know, don't be afraid to be creative. But you know, just you know, be creative. But just don't say post anything again that would you know get you fired or get you in trouble. <laughs> well, start and try. Like not everything's going to be a home run. We're asking you what's worked, but you know, I bet you if we ask you the question what hasn't worked, you'd be like, oh, let me tell you some stories. But mm -hmm. you just have to try. Don't. Fear, you know, screw fear, like fear. <laughs> just like, don't be afraid to try. You got to start someplace. I can mm -hmm. honestly say most of my terrific gaffes and screw ups and my, and my sales days, they don't, the, the client doesn't remember. They just ignored it. You know, most mm -hmm. of it, it's not like you're going to make it go to the public pool and belly flop. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it's funny for the moment even, and it's even painful, but no one remembers it. So just try, just try stuff. Unless yep. it goes viral, and then people will never forget it. Well, yep. <laughs> but even even viral stuff, like there are very few things we're still talking about a year later that went viral. So it just yes, exactly. Don't worry about it. That dress was blue and black, though. At any rate, so <laughs> Jeremy, <laughs> before we get out of here, the first thing I want to do is have you pitch Lead IQ because you're clearly evangelical about it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> evangelical about it so pitch that for a second and then um i think sean probably by now has a back of the envelope put a sticky note question for I you so, go ahead and pitch lead iq um what's what's so important about lead iq that people should know sure yeah i'll try to make it short and um not too salesy um but it's a tool that helps mainly sdrs and account executives be more efficient when they're prospecting and, you know, there's other data tools out there. I'm not going to, you know, name drop our competitors. There's other tools out there that can get you, you know, phone numbers and emails for prospects. Um, but what separates Lead IQ is the workflow efficiency. So being able to save a lot of the manual steps and manual clicking that a rep is having to do, cross-checking into a database and then cross-checking on LinkedIn to see if that person is still with the company, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then maybe um, they're having to push the data into Salesforce. And then from Salesforce, they're having to get it into Salesloft or Outreach, or um, they're only able to maybe, you know, visit, you know, import one person at a time. So it's just not as fast or scalable. Or, or a lot of the information is outdated. Our technology actually verifies it in real time. Um, so you click a button and it, the technology is actually going out in real time, finding and verifying it. So, even, you know, we know that people change jobs really frequently these days, like I said earlier. So, you know, it's a real time lookup. It's not pulling from a static database. So the real time lookup, the, the fast efficiency of the workflow that saves a rep a lot of time. Um, and then also getting cell phone numbers instead of direct dials, which on average get a sales rep a 300% higher connect rate on their calls. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean. Well, you have, I mean, I love that you're not afraid to push the envelope. Um, neither are we. I will push a sticky note, in fact. <laughs> so, Jeremy, okay. I have a, the question I have for you is kind of controversial um, this okay. time. Here, and, you know, we're not afraid to get in trouble, but here's the question I have for you. Okay, ready? All right. Is or is not Die Hard, in fact, a Christmas movie. <laughs> um, well, that's, that's a good question. It's been a long time since I've seen Die Hard. I, so um, I, I wouldn't really be able to tell you. Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen it a really long time. So Studies um, show that 76% of men between age 35 and 54 agree that Die Hard is actually a Christmas movie. I made that up. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. you got the you got the wrong age group here. <laughs> I asked yeah. my husband what I'm, his favorite. I'm just, I'm just under I'm just under that. I'm 32, so. I asked my husband what his favorite Christmas movie was. He said Die Hard. I went. Jeremy, what is your uh, favorite holiday movie? Uh, that's a that's a good question. I know. Favorite favorite Christmas movie. 
Um, I guess, I guess National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good one. That's that's a funny one. Ah. <laughs> uh. So, Jeremy, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm going to kick us out by saying, stop hoping and start selling. That's right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>